Well, let's get serious, and uh, we have some exciting guests here, and I'm very honored to introduce you to Dr. Winterton. Dr. Winterton is a Utah native. He's board certified in orthopedic surgery, and he's currently in private practice in Salt Lake City. Dr. Winterton is a graduate of the University of Utah piano performance. I love that. Following his graduation from Harvard Medical School, he completed a five-year orthopedic residency at the Mayo Clinic. Maybe a few of you have heard of that place, too. After his completion of two fellowships in sports medicine, shoulder and knee reconstruction, and foot and ankle reconstruction, he returned to Salt Lake City, where he established the Utah Cartilage Repair Center. Dr. Winterton currently sits on numerous boards. One is the Board of Counselors for the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, where he represents Utah orthopedic surgeons in Chicago and Washington, D.C., regarding health care policy and advocacy. And I happen to know he, he was doing his job in Washington, D.C. just recently. Dr. Winterton is also a member of the Executive Council of the Utah State Orthopedic Society. He's been married to the former Christy Ann Clark for 25 years, and he has four children. Dr. Winterton, please. While she's booting that up, how are the microphones working? I have this little lapel microphone. It's a real privilege to be here tonight. I like preaching to the choir, and it seems like we have a lot of choir members out there. So uh, it's just uh, an exciting time in the history of complementary alternative medicine and an exciting time to, to witness how we are transitioning from complementary alternative care that has traditionally been a little more edgy and moving and bridging that to what is traditional, what we call allopathic or Western medicine. Uh, how are we doing there? Give me a minute. Okay. Uh, it was very nice to hear Eric talk about some of the details, and I would concur with everything that Eric mentioned. Uh, while we're waiting to get this booted up, I'll just go ahead and just uh, tell you a little bit more about myself. So I am a board-certified orthopedic surgeon. I do carry the torch for the FDA and for all the wonderful things that Western medicine has for us. I do sit on the Board of Counselors at the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery, which gives me a forum to spend a lot of time in healthcare advocacy. I was in Washington, D.C. last week, and you'll be interested to hear a little a bit of data. Uh, office managers from both primary care and specialty care were there and reported that 80% of those practices in the United States have seen a dramatic drop in volume of patients that come into their office or volumes of surgery, which is very interesting. If, as a matter of fact, 80% of them reported that from January to March of 2013, they saw a drop in volume of patients coming to see them greater than any drop they've seen in 30 years. Now, a lot of that is because patients are fearful for losing their employment, Healthcare is becoming very expensive, and we are truly in a stage of uh, significant crisis in American healthcare. So, let's see. Should I get this a little closer as well, if I could? So, I did start the Utah Cartilage Repair Center here. It's just two blocks away, it's just southeast of here. Uh, I am the solo orthopedic surgeon for the Southtown Orthopedics. And I just told you I'm a board-certified orthopedic surgeon. Did my training at Mayo Clinic. I do sit on the Utah State Orthopedic Society board. And I'm on the board of counselors of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery. Standing next to me, as you may uh, recognize, is Dr. David Hill. And I do have to give a plug. I do believe that those who are most effective in uh, the issues surrounding ar aromatic science and aromatherapy are those who have spent the number of hours necessary to certify. And there's really very few people in the world or in the United States as qualified as Dr. Uh, Dave Hill. 
who really heads up the uh, medical advisory board for doTERRA. So I'd like to put a plug, and I do stand on shoulders of giants as I talk to you, and one of those is Dr. Dave Hill. Uh, so are you ready? You're all here in the classroom, and let's get started. So this is an outline. I won't go through that. I'm go going to really be brief with some of the things, but I will be talking about musculoskeletal medicine as well as tra traditional health care. So welcome to orthopedic surgery. An issue that I think many of you who may be involved with healthcare is dogma. The FDA approved medications are, are thought of as very dogmatic among those of my colleagues who are very dedicated to those particular medication modalities. I have issues with dogma. Many of you may think that traditional Western medicine is based on hard, core, basic science research and every prescription we provide and every surgical modality we provide is based on hardcore science. Let me give you an example. This is a rotator cuff tear. I did two of these today in the operating room. That's the rotator cuff tendon. And while we're in the operating room, we draw blood from patients. We get platelet-rich plasma, which is teeming with platelet-derived growth factor. And we put it at that rotator cuff site. Do we have any data? Do we have any randomized prospective double-blind studies that support that? No. We have empirical observational data. And you heard Eric stand at this podium and talk about all the wonderful anecdotal things that he's experienced with uh, essential oils, and many of you in the audience could come up and do the same. I don't mean to berate empirical anecdotal data. As a matter of fact, it's from this information that we've learned how to move ahead with hardcore basic science. And that's where we are. Since 2005, there's been a massive hockey stick of research internationally on essential oils. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. This is what has spawned my interest in this and why I'm very comfortable standing in a, at a podium to talk about what some may consider a little loosey-goosey science. Well, it's not. I'm here to tell you. Where do essential oils come from? We talked about that. Here are some lavender fields in southern France. This is eucalyptus. Procurement of essential oils have a, a significant effect based on elevation, time of season, climate and weather, and the time of harvest, and geography. Here's a great slide. These are chemical structures of a particular chemical, a bioactive chemical of time. And if you harvest time at 1,500 feet, you're going to get those chemicals versus here. And so we have to be very careful as we harvest essential oils from around the world that we know exactly what circumstances, what geographical and what uh, uh, types of climates we harvest these. How are essential oils harvested? Well, we know steam distillation, cold compression and expression and CO2 extraction. First steam distillation, we put the substance in there with the water. The aromatic compounds are distilled and collected over here. If they have heavy molecular weight, they don't make it over here. So essential oils are very unique in that we know the molecular weight, and that gives us the chemical properties and the bioactive properties on how they work. So steam distillation performed under carefully regulated temperature and pressure. Cold compression, we can harvest citrus and get a little larger molecular weight uh, constituents by doing that because we don't have to count on steam distillation. And finally, CO2 extraction, I won't go, go through the uh, physical chemistry of that. Question, and this is a good way to podium, give podium talks, and that's pose questions. You can write those down, and then here are the quick answers. How are essential oils analyzed and declared medicinal quality? And for those of you who are very involved with doTERRA, you must be very well acquainted with the distinction between perfume, scents, and flavors, the Justin Bieber uh, uh, perfumes, versus therapeutic grade bioactive aromatic compounds. That is what we use as physicians. That is what you use as distributing this as the lay public. There's certified pure therapeutic grade. That is a coin term that is unique to doTERRA. You need to understand the terms adulterated versus pure essential oils. Adulterated oils are those, say for example, lavenders that we might smell and say nice, uh, it's a nice scent but it has chemicals that have been added to it that are synthetic, and those can have significant side effects versus pure essential oils that have, which have virtually 
very few essential, uh, very few side effects. There is a place called the Essential Oil University. This would be, should be part of your vocabulary as you become acquainted with this. This is run by Dr. Rob Pappas. He's one of the world's greatest organic chemists. And uh, he does all of our gas chromat chromatography and mass spectroscopy. This is how we analyze. Now, I was on the phone with a biochemist the other day in Houston, and he was saying, well, do you know the molecular uh, weight of these uh, constituents? And do you know exactly what are in these oils? The dermatologist next to my office says the same thing. Yes, we do. This is rosemary. These spikes represent specific, very well, very carefully elucidated chemicals. We know exactly what the concentrations are in these oils. We know exactly the molecular structure of these oils. There, is, there are no vagaries, and this is just a gas chromatograph. That is not mass spectroscopy, which is even more specific. This is a lavender oil sample from Provo, and I was giving a talk, uh, and I was just going through my slides, and Rod Pappas stopped by, and I was kind of blasting through the slides like this, and he said, stop, go back. What is that, and why are you showing that, Dr. Winterton? And it's, well, that's a gas chromatograph of lavender. Well, that little spike is an adulteration. Do not show that slide. Well, that's an indication that we have very, very careful analyses. As a matter of fact, Rob Pappas knows the gas chromatograph fingerprint of 800 essential oils at the tip of his finger. So I'm very comfortable using his oils. He's affiliated, affiliated with the University of Indiana, and all of you should know that the oils that you're distributing are extremely and very carefully elucidated. So a topic I think you should know about, function follows form. Because we know what the chemical form of the constituents are of the oils, we know where they work in the body. We're elucidating and clarifying exactly where they work and what receptors they attach to in the nucleus, in the cytoplasm, and in the cell membranes. And it's important for you to know that's where we're headed with essential oil research. Question, what organ systems-based conditions and symptoms are treated with essential oils? Eric showed you a slide. You don't need to memorize this, but these are the, uh, the uh, pathologic entities that are treated throughout the world with essential oils. I've never been comfortable with people coming up and saying, oh, my mother is struggling with a certain spectrum of musculo, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of multiple sclerosis. Do you have an oil for that? Well, this multiple sclerosis isn't on there. But we do have anti-inflammatories, and we do have uh, essential oils that do spawn increased cellular uh, activity. And so that's what you should be focusing on. This, these are the pathologic entities that essential oils treat. We have analyzed uh, the antimicrobial, antibacterial uh, properties of essential oils. These are antibiograms and aromatograms, where we put a disc, either with antibiotics or essential oils, and we put them in a Petri dish, and we assess what kind of response the bacteria have in limiting the growth of bacteria. We've done this with every essential oil that we provide. There are antiviral properties. One of my favorite talks is to talk about OnGuard. This is, a, this is an oil that was recently uh, published, a study at the University of Oklahoma by a postdoc fellow from China. Uh, just to give you a little brief history, this is an influenza virus. When you get infected with an influenza virus, it enters your cell, goes into the cytoplasm, empties its DNA into the nucleus, and your own cells become virus factories. That nucleus then starts the process what we call the rough endoplasmic reticulum. You don't need to remember that, but that's where the protein coats of these viruses are formed. The viruses are integrated and then released out to infect other cells. This is what happens when you get influenza. Well, the study that was done at University of Oklahoma shows unequivocally, based on DNA analysis and protein analysis, that the blend in OnGuard stops the production of the protein coat at the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, you don't need to tell your physician or, uh, or scientist uh, acquaintances that, but we have elucidated that, and that was just uh, cells that were infected with human influenza in a Petri dish. They were human kidney cells where we just diffused the oil over that dish. We know exactly where it works. 
based on hardcore basic science. Similarly, with the herpes simplex virus, you're all very well acquainted with the research done with Melissa Oil and how it virtually stops and prevents the expression of herpes simplex on the lips and other various and sundry parts of our anatomy. Antifungals have been studied very carefully regarding essential oils. Uh, really a pleasant topic for me, anti-inflammatories. Uh, this is the inflammatory cascade. You don't need to understand this other than understand that the, the, the inflammatory process in the human body is a biochemical process, a cascade of events that occurs. Each event in the inflammatory cascade is, is uh, catalyzed by certain enzymes, four in particular. We've done anti-inflammatory studies of all the essential oils. Uh, since about 2001, there have been a huge number of studies, and Dr. Miguel in Portugal put together a meta-analysis. Now, you don't need to remember this. You can't read it. But what each of these, what each of these lists are are either constituents of particular molecules in specific oils or specific oils, and which enzyme it attacks and inhibits the inflammatory cascade. Now this is exciting to me in that I feel very comfortable telling my patients, put these oils on your inflamed knee or on your shoulder. And it's just exciting. As a matter of fact, helichrysum from Yugoslavia, very expensive oil, uh, attacks all four of those catalysts for the inflammatory cascade. These are the classic anti-inflammatory essential oils. They're found in deep blue rub, with which you're very well acquainted. A difficult topic to discuss when it comes to essential oils are the neurotropic essential oils, those that go to the brain and affect things like anxiety. We know that there are essential oils based on very good studies that are anxiolytic, meaning it takes away your anxiety, that are sedatives, that are stimulants, and very effective regarding antidepressant activity. A lot of the studies we've done are on rats, where we diffuse oils and we watch their motility based on certain parameters of how they move and how they get about the cage. Question, have essential oils been assessed for a spectrum of toxicity and contraindications? Yes, we've studied them at length. And even interesting is, uh, you look on this side, here are some oils and the amount of oil that it would take to kill 50% of the humans that would take that dose. And we're talking liters of essential oils that can kill you. A few drops internally are not dangerous. We do know that, if, that there are certain pathologic conditions that you shouldn't take certain essential oils. You don't need to memorize that, but we have studied this all the way from abdominal pain, asthma, breast cancer, epilepsy, glaucoma, hemorrhaging, high blood pressure, etc., etc., including pregnancy. This is the end organ of essential oils. This is where essential oils do their work and we're in the process of carefully clarifying exactly where essential oils work at the cellular level. Here we have the nucleus, we have the cytoplasm, and the cell membrane. So, moving on to organic chemistry. Now, don't be concerned. How many of you have had any organic chemistry classes? Okay, well, good. I'm in decent company then. But I'm sorry for those of you, I'm not going to blast, I'm going to just blast through this. Essential oils are made of multiple constituents, some of them 80 or 90 chemicals, some of them bioactive and inactive. We have elucidated single specific molecules, and we're also clarifying what molecules uh, work or their mechanism of action, their MOA. So stick with me here. I'm going to blast through the next many slides. I'm going to show you molecule, molecule compounds, and I'm going to show how they work. And I'm just going to blast through these. This is, I, I preserved this talk to go into a little more detail with those who are a little more scientifically oriented. So the organic chemistry, five carbon isoprene units that's a basic building block of terpenes. And we put two of those together and we get a monoterpene. Let me show you what they look like. When you see a structure like this, actually you're seeing carbon atoms with attached hydrogen atoms. That's what, that's what the uh, Rob Pappas would look at and say, oh, okay, that's, a, that's an isoprene unit. We put two isoprene units together, they're called monoterpenes. Monoterpenes do that. Now for those skeptics out there that may say, well, you really don't know what essential, how they work, well, we do. And this is the pharmacology, and this is the reality. Accept it or reject it, this is what we know. 
Sesquiterpenes are huge molecules. This is what they do. Diterpenes, even larger. We can't even distill these. These are what we find in a lot of our citrus. This is what they do. Alcohols, this is what they do. Phenols, this is what they do. Methyl ethers, this is what they do. We know the chemical structure, we know the form of the molecule, and we know where it goes. So function follows form. Everyone write that down because we understand the chemical structure or form of the molecule, and we know where and how it works. Aldehydes, this is what they do. Ketones, very dangerous. Got to be careful with these. This is what they do. Organic acids and esters, this is what they do. Oxides, this is what they do. Lactones, this is what they do. Organic chemistry of essential oils, that's in 30 seconds, not too bad. I do want to say one thing, and many of our skeptics say, well, golly, if essential oils are so effective and efficacious, well, then why hasn't Merck or Bayer got a hold of these and reproduced these? Because we cannot repro reproduce in a lab Mother Nature because of this issue. You can have the same chemical formula, but have it be completely different structurally. This molecule here and this molecule here have the exact same chemical formula, but they have completely different geometric shapes that depend on where they're harvested, how they're harvested, and what elevation they're harvested, and Merck and Bayer can't do it. That's why the FDA can't approve these, which is a great thing. Essential oils are non-reproducible, non-patentable by pharmaceutical companies. They're here. Mother Nature has provided them for you, and here we are talking about them. Question. Why should we be interested in therapeutic potential of essential oils? Question number two, are FDA-approved medication within modern medical tradition superior to essential oils? And finally, if essential oils are so potent and therapeutically effective, why hasn't traditional pharmaceutical R&D research and development pursued pat the patent processes with them? I just answered that question. This is why we don't like FDA-approved medicines. They're single chemicals, aspirin, by the way, one chemical distilled from nothing less, nothing more than willow bark. But it has horrendous side effects responsible for hundreds of thousands of deaths from bleeding annually, and as well as all the other anti-inflammatories. I don't like this part of my medical practice where I give patients one single chemical. And this is what, what the problem is with American and Western medicine. It's fast food medicine. We want a cure yesterday, and we want it now. But the problem is you increase that potency with a single chemical, and you have horrendous side effects. And we're all very well acquainted with that. I'm not here to berate my wonderful tradition of Western medicine. I'm here as a, a, as a spokesman for caution, as a physician who dispenses these medications and uh, has complications with these medications every day. Two principles you should know. Write these down. Synergism and quenching. These are two important principles that you must understand why we like essential oils versus FDA-approved essential oils. Synergism, all of the molecules in an essential oil work better together than alone. They work together at certain receptors in the cell to function. A single acetyl salicylic acid molecule in aspirin has serious side effects because we took that molecule from its native willow bark, and we mass produce it. The other molecules that we left behind helps calm or quench the side effects. And that's what quenching is. The side effects of one molecule are decreased in the presence of the other molecules in essential oils. That's why it's so wonderful to have 30 bioactive chemicals in lavender that each quench and provide synergism with each other. Question, how are essential oils administered and at what doses? going to blast past that. How are they administered? Topical application. You'll have some dermatologists still say there's no way these essential oils transfer through the skin, through the epidermis, dermis, into your circulation. That's bunk. We have hardcore science that is unequivocal now. Okay, so don't let Dr. Google tell you otherwise, okay? <laughs> we do know that they find their way into the follicles. They find their way into the circulation and lymphatic. We know that as a fact. There are ways we can improve absorption, uh, and we can do that through some types of electrical stimulation. Iontophoresis 
This is an iontophoresis patch where I put essential oils here and essential oils there. The positive charged constituents are repelled into the skin and attracted to the negative pole. Likewise, the negatively charged uh, constituents of essential oils are repelled by the negative charge and, and uh, attracted by the other, thus improving absorption transdermally. One of the most frustrating things as you move into the application of essential oils is understanding carrier bases. You'll read about hundreds from sweet almond to what doTERRA often pushes is a fractionated coconut oil. These work. I've been on the phone with the developers of a new device that is FDA approved. Uh, it's called Lipoderm Active Max. And this is uh, now what the FDA has approved to transmit anti-inflammatories transdermally rather than taking them orally to decrease the systemic side effects. You'll be hearing more about this. I'm trying to get the uh, producers of Actimax in Houston to become very well acquainted with what could be a worldwide distribution model of some company in Orem, Utah. I don't know. <laughs> Sequential cryo cryocompression, you can compress and release compression, and that will improve lymphatic distribution of essential oils. So that's dermal distribution. Secondly, this is an electron micrograph of an alveolus. We can breathe in essential oils. They're immediately sent into your uh, systemic circulation. Or you can breathe them in through your nostrils, and it goes directly to your brain through what's called the cribriform plate, where the olfactory nerve goes straight into your brain. Uh, we know essential oils do pass the blood-brain barrier. So that's number two. First, dermal absorption. Second, uh, inhalation. Third, uh, uh, internal uh, in, internal use. Uh, very common in France, not so common in the United Kingdom, and broadly used internally in the United States now. We do have suppositories, too, for our patients, believe it or not. As an orthopedic surgeon, I'm very excited about the application of essential oils in the management of uh, certain bone infections. Some of our colleagues in uh, in Australia are using essential oils rather than traditional tobramycin or gentamicin, hardcore antibiotics, where they're putting melaleuca instead of those antibiotics and having great success in prevention. So, in get, getting close to the end of my talk, my clinical applications as a physician, as a Western medicine specialist, are pre- and post-operative peppermint and ginger, pre- and post-operative antimicrobial rubs, on open wounds, I'm using these. Pre- and post-operative anti-inflammatory rubs, warm, wet compresses in my office, and diffusion of antimicrobial oils in every one of my rooms, including every one of my children's room at home. This is what I do every day in the operating room. 550 times a, uh, a year, I give patients a spritzer of peppermint and ginger in their palm. They do it on their way to the operating room. They breathe deeply. Uh, and they inhale through their nostril and mouth and exhale through their nostril and mouth to make sure that all their mucous membranes are covered with what are the significant constituents in ginger and peppermint that are very helpful in moderating and mediating nausea, vomiting, and motion sickness. It's great for amusement parks. It's great for car sickness. And I've really had great success. The University of North Carolina did a randomized, prospective, double-blind study published in the most prestigious anesthesia journal, Anesthesia and Analgesia. I'm sure you'll get a copy. And, but but it, it's hardcore science, and we now have it. Clinical applications that I love to see are at the end of finish lines of marathons, ultra marathons. I don't know if you've ever been to an ultra marathon at the end of a 100-mile run where people are barely limping across the finish line. They get uh, samples of deep blue and immediately up and walking because of the anti-inflammatory mediation. Sidelines, locker rooms, rehabilitation, pre-event warm-ups, antimicrobial workout surfaces. Uh, we can, we're starting to treat wrestling mats with essential oils because they're very um, uh, micro, uh, bacteriostatic and bactericidal. One thing I'd like to encourage those of you who may still be skeptics after hearing a lot of this hot air from me today, just spend a little time on PubMed. Here's an example. If you put, if you just log on PubMed.com and you put review in parentheses and aromatherapy, you'll see in the last 10 years, 182 review articles of essential oils and their clinical application. It's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. And you either get on board and get it in your medicine cabinet or just continue 
using the potent FDA-approved medications with all their side effects. Aromatic Science was launched by doTERRA in April 1st, 2013. I was with Dave, I was with Dave Hill in uh, Washington, D.C. last week, and uh, he kind of whispered over to me, ah, uh, Young Living is uh, starting to publish all of the acts, all the links to Aromatic Science. They don't know it's affiliated with us yet. So <laughs> maybe after this talk, they might, and I suspect Gary Young will probably try to sue Aromatic Science soon as well. Uh, this is my contact information. Uh, you're welcome to uh, email me. Uh, my poor billing secretary checks my PWW at xmission.com regularly. And I'd like to thank you all for listening and really look forward to getting better acquainted. And I hope this talk has clarified for those skeptics that essential oils isn't something you no longer have to say, do you believe in essential oil? I, I do, but uh, some people don't. It's like asking, do you believe in ibuprofen? We know where ibuprofen works. We know their side effects. We know where essential oils work. And we know their side effects. And it's time we get used to that in modern Western medicine. Thank you very much.